This is the 11th lecture on, on light in modern times. Uh, I remind you that last week I uh, studied how lasers can be used to achieve high resolution spectroscopy, how one can take advantage of the high intensity of lasers, also of the monochromaticity and the co long, great coherence, uh, spatial and, and temporal coherence. Uh, to achieve high resolution by getting rid, by suppressing the Doppler effect. I also discussed another way to suppress the Doppler effect, which is to trap the atoms in a small region of, of space uh, so that the atoms do not move too much and so the Doppler effect is reduced. And I described that in the case of charged atoms, ions. In this case, uh, the charge of the atom can be used as a kind of handle to, to force the particle to stay in a well-defined, in a confined space. Uh, this week, I would like to study what can be done with neutral atoms, atoms which uh, don't have a charge, so it's not as easy to, to cool them and to trap them as ions, but methods have been developed uh, starting in the 1980s when the lasers have become stable enough, intense enough, and monochromatic enough to be able to use them to manipulate in subtle, in subtle ways uh, neutral atoms. In fact, uh, a pioneering paper about that possibility was published in the 1960s by Arthur Ashkin, who was working at Bell Labs, and who said that with laser, it should be possible to cool atoms down to suppress their velocity and to study them in detail. But it took another 15 years before that could be developed because the lasers in the 1960s were not uh, uh, well uh, developed. Did not, well, well, it was very difficult to uh, control with precision their frequency and their intensity. And uh, this happened later when tunable laser were developed and in the 1980s, many pioneering experiments have been done to demonstrate different ways to trap cool atoms and to manipulate them with light. And so I would like to discuss that in uh, this week lecture. So this is the outline of the lecture. I will first describe the two kinds of light induced forces. One force is called the dissipative force, it is radiation pressure. And the other one is called the reactive force. And I will uh, tell you the differences between these two forces, which are both used in the methods used to cool and to trap atoms. Then I will discuss a simple case, which is called Doppler cooling, and which uh, works on two level system and two level atoms. And I will evaluate the limit in temperature, which can be reached with Doppler cooling. Then I will analyze a more subtle methods to cool atoms, uh, which achieve sub-Doppler cooling, which achieve even lower temperatures. And I will talk about what is known as the Sisyphus effect, which is a combination of dissipative and reactive forces. The two kinds of forces are being used simultaneously and in, in correlated with each other to achieve even lower temperatures. After that, I will describe experiments which have been no, done with laser cooled atoms, so we talk about atomic optics. What is atomic optics? Uh, when you cool atoms, uh, you increase the De Broglie wavelengths and you get atomic matter waves, which have a long De Broglie wavelengths. By long, I mean of the order of micrometers. You get De Broglie wavelengths, which are of the order of optical wavelengths. And so you can do with atoms what, what before done and what is done with light, that is to do interference experiments with matter waves to do, uh, to build devices which are based on interference effects. And I will describe that in, in, uh, in this part of the lecture. I will in particular describe one part of interfer one kind of interferometer, which is very, uh, which has been developed during the last year, which allows to measure with a very high precision, the gravitational field, gravimeters. Then I will in the last part of the talk, discuss both Einstein condensation. I told you in the first lecture that Einstein had predicted this new phase of matter for bosons back in the 1920s, but we had to wait for 70 years for lasers to become uh, 
sophisticated enough to enable to do that, to, to achieve boson chain condensation with uh, atomic bosons. And I will describe these experiments. And finally, I will give you an example of what can be done with these very cold uh, atomic gases. I will describe an experiment in which one can simulate effects which usually, which were impossible to study before because it was impossible to manipulate, to, to, to vary continuously the parameter of a condensed matter system with cold bosons in cold Bose-Einstein condensate. It's possible to perform experimentally, uh, to observe experimentally phenomena which were predicted before, but which were impossible to, to observe in, in an actual experiment. So let's start with uh, a qualitative description of radiative forces. And I will start with the simplest possible system, which is a two level system, which has a ground state and uh, an excited state. And a laser is tuned to uh, excite the transition between the ground and the excited state. So the atom can absorb light to go from G to E, and then he remits, it remits light by spontaneous emission. So how, what is a dissipative force? A dissipative force is just what we call radiation pressure. When, when the atom absorbs light, the conservation of energy and momentum requires for the system to, to conserve the energy and to conserve the momentum, which means that when phot one photon is absorbed, the momentum of the photon is transmitted to the atom. So I have shown you what happens here. You have an atom in the ground state. Photons arrive on the atom. One photon is absorbed, so the atom becomes excited. But then it takes away. It absorbs also the momentum. So it gets a kick. Its momentum increases. And uh, after some time, it will spontaneously emit a photon to come back on the, the ground state. But the photon, which is re-emitted by spontaneous emission, is, em is emitted randomly in all possible directions. So during the cycle of absorption and emission, the absorption, in the absorption process, the atom gains momentum. But in the emission, on average, it does not, its momentum does not change because the probabilities are the same for the photon to be emitted in one direction or in the opposite direction. So as a result, in each cycle, the momentum of the atom changes by h bar delta k, where delta k is uh, the uh, momentum, the uh, h bar delta k, which is h bar k minus k uh, re-emitted, scattered. k is the momentum, h bar k is the momentum of the absorbed photon, and minus h bar k del, kd is the momentum of the re-emitted photon. But on average, this term cancels. And in fact, what happens is that the atom gains momentum H bar K in each cycle of absorption and remission. This process can occur many, many times per second because the lifetime of the excited state is short. So at the rate gamma, where well, gamma is the reciprocal of the excited state uh, spontaneous emission time, at the rate gamma, this process goes on and on. Each time the atom gains uh, the energy H Again, the momentum h bar k. So in the end, uh, the, the maximum force which is uh, transmitted from the atom to the field is h bar k k over two. Why the factor one one half? It's because at saturation, when the process becomes very e efficient, the probability for the atom to be in the ground state is one half, and the probability to be in the excited state is one half. So the saturating exchange of momentum per unit time is h bar gamma k over two. And this is a this radiation pressure force at saturation. From this force, you can immediately obtain the maximum acceleration, which is just the force divided by the mass of the atom. And so the acceleration is h bar k gamma over two m. And when you put orders of magnitude in the mass of a typical atom, for example, sodium or rubidium, you find that this acceleration is about 210 to the six meter per second. So it's a huge acceleration, an acceleration which is about 10 to the five times the acceleration of gravitation. 
it means that the atom can be braked very efficiently by absorbing the light which is propagating in the opposite direction of its velocity and we will see how this can be done uh, a little bit later so this is one process it's a very simple one just conservation of momentum between atom and light while atom absorb photons the second process is called react the reactive force or the dipolar force dipolar force and i will give you a qualitative explanation on this slide again we consider a two-level atom and you assume now that it is uh, irradiated by a light beam which is below resonance that is the frequency of the light is smaller than the frequency of the photon emission by an amount delta with this much frequency what i have described in previous lectures is that in this case you get an effect which is called a light shift that is atoms cannot be absorbed because an absorption would not conserve energy but the energy levels of the atoms are shifted by this non-resonant interaction and in the case of a what we call a red side detuning that is the light is on the red side of the atomic transition the ground state is shifted down and the excited state is shifted up and so this shift it's an energy shift of the atomic level which depends on the position of the atom because the light beam the light beam which uh, irradiates the atom has a position dependence if you get out of the light beam the light shift decreases of course and so this energy shift depends upon the position of the atom and the derivative of the energy shift with respect to the position is by definition a force so the atoms in the gradient of light intensity the atoms will experience a force which is quite different from the radiation pressure and this is called the reactive force so this is one explained interpretation there is another one which is equivalent which is shown here what happens if you apply an electric field to an atom as we have seen before the atom gets polarized this means that the positive and negative charges are pulled in opposite direction and so they they are Paris center does not uh, coincide anymore and you get an electric dipole an induced dipole on the atom and this induced dipole means that the positive uh, charge is pulled in one direction and the negative in the opposite direction but what happens if the electric intensity is not constant one force is bigger or smaller than the other So this, uh, so you see the positive and the negative uh, charges are pulled in opposite direction. And if there is a gradient of the electric field, one force will be bigger than the other. And so the atom will be pulled in one direction or the other. This is what happens when the electric field is pointing in one direction. Of course, the electric field will change directions very fast, but the force does not change direction because as the electric field change direction, the dipole also change sign. And so the action of the electric field on the dipole remains the same. It's a constant force which pull the atom in one way or the other. And if the detuning delta is negative, if you're on the right side of the absorption line, it is easy to show that the atom is pulled towards intense fields. It is attracted at the focus of the laser beam. On the other hand, if the detuning is positive, that is, if the frequency of the light is above the atomic transition, then the atom is ejected from the light field. So the force, the sign of the force, depends on the sign of the detuning. So these are qualitative explanations, but you can just put this in a very quantitative uh, theory, which I will present here very briefly. But I think it's important at, at this level to understand qualitatively the nature of these different forces. Here, I will give you the formulas which allow us to calculate explicitly the force in all cases. So you see here, this is the expression, the most general expression of the electric field of a light beam. You have an intensity, which is a function of position, an amplitude, which is a function of position, E alpha, 
epsilon is a polarization. And then you have the time dependent term, which is a cosine function of time, omega L being the frequency of the laser. And you have also a phase phi of R, which depends on position. So the electric field depends on position through its amplitude, which can depend on position, and through its phase, which also can depend on position. And uh, the two kinds of forces, the uh, radiation, the dissipative force, which is radiation pressure, depends on the gradient of the phase, whereas the reactive force depends on the gradient of the amplitude. So how does it work? First of all, I remind you that the interaction between the atom and the light is just the electric dipole of the atom scalar product with the amplitude of the field. So you have an, an energy which is given by this term and d e over h bar is called the Rabi frequency. This is the, the strength of the coupling is described by the product of the electric dipole of the atom by the amplitude of the electric field. And this is divided by h bar, it's a unit, frequency unit, which is called the Rabi frequency. And we discussed that already. So what is the average light force? It is just the gradient, the special variation of the product of D with E. And you can write it in this way. It's D is the, the, the average dipole of the atom in the light beam. And here gradient of EI is a gradient of the I component of the electric field. So you have three components, X, Y, Z, you make the scalar product and you take the gradient of the electric field and you get this expression. What is this term here, this average term here? This is the average electric dipole of the atom in the light field. And in previous lectures, I discussed that uh, this induced dipole, I told you that the electric field is driving the atomic charges. And there is a dipole which is proportional to the electric field for low amplitude. And this induced dipole is the, explains two things. It explains why atoms absorb light. And it also explains why when the light is non-resonant, there is a refractive index, which depends on upon frequency and which explains why light is propagating at a different velocity in a medium. So this electric dipole has two components. One component, which is in phase with the electric field. This is the reactive component, which is responsible for the index effect. And one component, which is pi over two out of phase with the electric field, which is the component which absorb or emit energy in the field, which defines the energy exchange, the absorption and emission of photons. And this is what I show you here. You see here, uh, the expectation value of the electric dipole. This term is a term which is in phase with the field. And this term is a term which is in quadrature with the field, which is a sine function, whereas the field is a cosine. So let's first look at this part. This part is the reactive force. When you compute the amplitude of this term, the term U here, you find this Lorentzian curve, this dispersion Lorentzian curve, which is uh, proportion to delta, where delta is a detuning between the laser and the atomic transition. And uh, I discussed already this expression when we discussed magnetic resonance. I, I showed that the solution of the block equation, which describes the steady state of the atomic system driven by the electromagnetic field, you have this function, which is the term which is in phase with the electric field. And you have the other part here, which I have shown in red, which is has a Lorentzian absorption shape and which is a part in like, like this one, which is a sine function in quadrature with the electric field. So what happens when you make the product of D with E? You see immediately here that the part, if you have a cosine here, if you want to have a non-zero average, you have to multiply it by the cosine, which is here. So this is the product of DE. And cosine square omega will give you an average of one half. So you will have a non-zero average. And the gradient here will be the gradient of the amplitude. So you see that this part is connected to the gradient of the amplitude of the field. Whereas in this part, if you have a sign here, you have to 
take the gradient of the phase because the gradient of the phase will give you the derivative of cosine, which is a sine function. So this term here is a term which is sensitive to the gradient of the phase, whereas this term is sensitive to the gradient of the amplitude. And so you can separate in this expression very clearly what is the reactive and what is uh, the dissipative force. And this is what I express here again. And I do the, uh, I present it quickly because you have all on the slide uh, all the uh, steps to do the calculation. The dissipative part is proportional to the gradient of the phase, and the gradient of the phase is obvious. If you have, for example, a plane wave, the gradient of the phase is just minus k because a, a, a plane wave has a form e i omega t minus k z. And so, if you take the gradient of the phase, you find just minus k. So this part is given by this expression, and you see at saturation, when omega is very large, you find h bar k gamma over 2, which is the expression I, I gave you at the beginning of the lecture, qualitatively, you find again that you have a force which is maximum at resonance, and which is saturated at the value h bar k gamma over 2. This is the dissipative force, the radiation pressure. What about the other force? This is a gradient of the amplitude. That is a gradient, the gradient of omega. And when you do the calculation, you find you have an omega here and the gradient of omega here. You have one omega which is hidden in u. So you have gradient of omega squared. Gradient of omega squared is a gradient of the intensity. So you find here a force which is proportional to the gradient of intensity and which is dispersive, which cancels at resonance. And this is the reactive force for which I gave you a qualitative explanation already. This force, if you, are, if you have a large detuning, if delta is very large compared to gamma and omega, this force increases with light intensity as gradient of E square over delta. So it's a force which does not saturate. If you are far from resonance, if you excite with a laser, for example, an infrared laser on an optical transition, as you increase the intensity of the light, the force becomes larger and larger, and it can become very big compared to the uh, radiation pressure. This force, of course, is a light shift effect. It's a gradient of the light shift, and the light shifts can become very, very large. I told you in the few lectures ago that the light shift was discovered by uh, Claude Cohen Tanuji back in the optical pumping experiments at that time. The light shift he was able to observe were about one hertz translated in energy. Now the light shift can be gigahertz or tens of gigahertz. They can be tens orders of magnitude bigger. And they, they are the kind of effects which allow us to manipulate, to trap, and to manipulate atoms, as I will show you in a moment. So now that we have recalled all this, let's come back to the description of laser cooling experiments. And I will start by discussing a very simple case, again, a two-level atom, one dimension, an atom which is going from left to right, as you can see here, with a given velocity, and a counter-propagating laser beam, which is tuned below resonance. So it's tuned at a frequency which is smaller than the atomic frequency. Now, in the rest frame of the atom, in this configuration, you see that in order to be on resonance, the laser should have a frequency omega eg minus kv because this is a Doppler effect. If, if the, the laser beam is propagating against the velocity of the atom, obviously you have to have a laser which is below resonance so that the Doppler effect will put again the atom in resonance. So you see in this case, you will have a force which will decrease the velocity of the atom. If the resonance condition is maintained, you see the velocity of the atom will just decrease linearly as a function of time with AD being the acceleration that I computed before uh, on the previous slide. And you find immediately that you can, in, in fact, if you start with an atom which has a velocity of the order of 500 meters per second, which is a typical thermal velocity, you would need about 0.2 milliseconds 200 microseconds to, to stop the atom, to go from 500 meters second per second basically to zero. And you can compute easily the breaking distance, and you find about 
60 centimeters. So you see with, on a distance like that, you start with an atom which has a thermal velocity, you shine a laser light in the opposite direction and the atom will slow down and stop. But of course, to do that, you have to solve one problem. As the atom will go slower and slower, the Doppler effect will change. And if the atom is able to absorb light at the beginning, it will get out of resonance and the effect will stop to be, will no longer be effective. So in order to make sure that the atom stays in resonance, uh, a trick has been uh, imagined by Bill Phil William Phillips, who did the first experiment of this kind uh, back in the 1980s. The atom is propagating inside a solenoid and the magnetic field varies, decreases along the trajectory, and it decreases exactly in the way to compensate for the change in the Doppler effect. This is called the Zeeman slower. And when the, as the atom propagates out of the oven against the laser beam, it stays in resonance all the time because due to the Zeeman effect, due to the fact that the energy varies with the magnetic field, it stays in resonance with the laser light. And so with the Zeeman slower, it's possible really to slow atom down. And Bill Phillips was the first one to see at the end of this solenoid uh, a, a cloud of atoms having a near zero velocity. Why, how did he, did he see it? The mere fact that the laser excites the atom all the time and the fluorescence of the atom of the resonance light is a way you can see them. So by just looking at the cloud with the naked eye, you see a bright spot which correspond to atoms which are near zero velocity. And in order to achieve this gradient of a magnetic field, you just have a winding of the solenoid with more coil turns here than here. So you make a solenoid which, with a diminishing number of uh, uh, coils per unit length. So this is the way the slowing was achieved. Then the question, of course, is what can you do if the atoms are not moving in only in one direction? If you are in a gas, for example, the atoms can have all kinds of velocities. And then you have to invent a way to cool the atoms, whether they go in one direction or in the other. And I will start with a one dimension problem. So you have an atom which can go either from left to right or from right to left. And what you do now is that you shine on the atom two lasers with opposite directions. And both lasers have a frequency which is below uh, the, the resonance frequency. They are both right shifted. And you can see immediately what will happen. If the atoms go from left to right with a positive velocity, it will, of course, be closer to resonance with this laser and with that one, because this, the Doppler effect will get the atom closer to resonance and away from resonance for this laser. And the opposite will happen if the velocity is turned around. So if you plot now the force experienced by the atom as a function of its velocity, you see that if the velocity is positive, this is a blue laser which will exert a negative force. So this is this blue curve. And if the velocity is negative, if you are on that part of the curve, this is this laser, the red laser, which will produce a positive force. So you get this curve here. And the total force seen by the atom is now the sum of the red and the blue curve, which is this dispersive curve. And you see that the force is zero at resonance because then the two lasers have opposite effects. And if you go in one direction, the force will be a restoring force negative. If you go in the opposite direction, the force will be a positive force. So in both cases, the force is opposite to, to, to the velocity. And a force which is opposite to the velocity is called it, it's equivalent to a viscous force. It's a force which decreases, has a tendency to decrease the velocity, whether it is in one direction or in the other. And for this reason, this kind of uh, uh, system of lasers is called an optical molasse. A molasse is a medium like, like a pot of honey. If you drop uh, a, a, a small marble in the pot of honey, you see it will be the friction force will make it reach a limiting velocity very quickly. So the system is a system in which all forces are damped away 
all the velocities are dumped away and the, the system cannot, the particles uh, cannot move very quickly in the system. So here we have an optical modus in two dimension, in, in one dimension. I let you do the calculation in the case where if you choose, in fact, the velocity has to be between these two values for, for the atom to be captured. So the velocity has to be smaller than gamma over k in order to, that to, you are in this part of the curve. And you can achieve that with uh, the case of a Rabi frequency, which is small to gamma, small compared to gamma and delta. In this case, the expression of the force is given by this expression here. And the coefficient, which describes the viscosity of the system, that is, the ratio between the force and the velocity, you have a force which is minus alpha V and alpha is given by this, this expression. And alpha is a reciprocal of the damping time. M over two, one over two is a damp, two is a damping time, the time it takes for a velocity to be, to be damped to the limiting value. And when you put the order of magnitude, you find that it takes about 100 microseconds to stop, to, to bring the atoms to this limiting velocity, to this very small velocity, which is uh, around zero. So this is a phenomenon which was understood back in the beginning of the 1980s. And it's called, for the reason I explained to you, an optical molasse. But this is just a one dimension uh, model. And you can generalize it to three dimension. What you do now is that you apply couples of lasers with opposite direction in the direction X, Y, and Z. And this configuration of six lasers is such that an atom, which is at the intersection of these three these laser beams, will be slowed down whatever his direction, because there will always be a laser counter propagating, which will be closer to resonance than the, the laser going in the opposite direction. So this is a 3D optical molas. You see, the, in the first experiment, what was done is shown here. You have first, you start from an oven, you have this Zeeman slower, and you have a laser which is cooling the atomic beam. And at the exit of this Zeeman slower, you apply these three, these lasers in all directions. And at the intersection of the lasers, you get a very bright cloud of cold atoms. And you see here a picture, one of the first experiments of this kind. These are sodium atoms, which have a yellow fluorescence. You see the, the, the trace that you can see on top is a trace of the lasers, the laser which uh, does the Zeeman slowing of the atoms. And then you have the, the three pairs of beam intersecting here. This bright cloud in the center, it corresponds to about uh, 1 billion sodium atoms which are moving slowly with a velocity of the order of a few meters per second at the intersection of the three beams. So how can you measure the temperature? How can you measure the average velocity of the atoms? The technique is very simple. At, at time t equals zero, you cut all the lasers. So the atoms will start with their initial velocity and they will fall in the gravitational field of the Earth. And below the molas, you have a, an horizontal laser. When the atoms fall in the beam here, they will fluoresce. And you just have to measure the delay between the moment at which you have shut down the laser and the moment when the fluorescence appears. And you can reconstruct the distribution of atoms at the time you disconnected the lasers. And when this was done, there was a very big surprise. In fact, one found a temperature of the order of one micro Kelvin, that is 10 minus six, one millionth of one degree. And this was two orders of magnitude smaller than what was predicted by the, the, the simple two level atom models that I described before. So this is a very rare example of an experimental situation, which gives a result much better than what the, the theory was predicting. So it was a good surprise, but the problem, of course, the challenge was to understand why the cooling was much more effective than was, was expected. And this is what I will try 
uh, to explain in a few minutes. The first thing I would like to recall uh, is why people were predicting much higher temperature. In fact, what the simple model was predicting is that the temperature should be about 200 microkelvin instead of one. 200 microkelvin is cold. It's a temperature which is less than one thousandth of one uh, degree, but it's much, still much bigger than what was really observed. So where, is this, where was this predict, prediction coming from? And in fact, it was coming from a fluctu, what is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which uh, is another big discovery of Einstein. When I discussed at the beginning of this lecture, uh, the big papers of Einstein during the year 1905, I talked to you about the relativity paper. I talked to you about the uh, uh, light quanta paper. I talked to you about the E equal MC square paper. So three very important papers. There were a fourth paper, which was about the Brownian motion, Brownian motion, which is a paper in which Einstein was able to deduce from the Brownian motion the characteristic of the atom. So it was a paper which demonstrated that the atom should exist because by, by theory. And in this paper, he discussed what is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. What it means that when you have a dissipation process, the fact that there is some kind of friction which dissipate energy, to this dissipation process, you must have also, you must have also as the other side of the same coin, a fluctuation process which has a tendency to increase the energy of the system. The dissipation makes the system lose energy in, in its environment and the fluctuations bring energy back and there is an equilibrium between the two. In, in what we are studying here, of course, the friction is quite clear. When the atoms lose velocity, where is the energy going? The energy is going in the light because you shine light which is below resonance and the fluorescence is at resonance. So the light is gaining energy. Each time a photon is scattered by the atom, there is more energy in the light and less energy in, in the atom. So the friction is the fact that the atom is braked. The friction comes from the interaction of atom with light. And what is the fluctuation? The fluctuation comes from the fact that each time the atom re-emits a photon, there is a recoil of the atom, and this recoil can happen in all kinds of directions. And this recoil is similar to the recoil of atoms in the Brownian motion. The fact that in the Brownian motion, the atom exchange momentum with a small particle uh, which uh, are, are affected by this motion. And the, the fluctuation of this exchange of momentum is the fluctuating part. So in this case, how can you balance the two? You see this equation here, this describe dissipation. The energy of the gas decreases with a constant two over tau, where tau is given by the quantity that I described on the previous slide. So this is the dissipation part. And the fluctuation part is just the fact that the energy of the atom should increase by a quantity, uh, which is, this is a recoil energy for each process. And during time t, you have gamma t processes of this kind. And so d over dt is just gamma times this. And then what you have to do is to write that the fact that this fluctuation term compensates exactly for this dissipation one. So you add the two. And when you do that, you find that the average energy is just h bar gamma. So you find that the limiting energy of, in the system is just h bar gamma, which means that the temperature is h bar gamma over Kaboltzmann. So this is a Doppler limit. This is called the Doppler limit. And this is the quantity, which is equal to about 200 uh, micro Kelvin for sodium atom and 140 micro Kelvin for rubidium atom. Why are they different? They are different because the masses of the atom are different. And uh, the, this temperature is one over the square root of the mass. So one was expecting a temperature which was much above the one which was observed. So now let's try to explain why the temperature is much lower than what is expected. What was understood very quickly is the fact that this model is too simplistic. In, in this model, you assume a two-level atom. 
but the real alkali atom, rubidium or sodium, have a structure in their ground state. So it's not a two level atom, it's atoms which have different levels. And these levels are affected in a different way by light shifts. And what we will see is that the cooling process is much more efficient because you have a combination of this of, uh, of the uh, uh, dissipative force, which is the radiation pressure and the reactive force. They both conspire to lower the temperature in the system. And then I'll try to, to give you, to explain to you qualitatively what happens. The, the model that we take here is two counter propagating lasers, the, the structure of a one dimension molas, and with linear polarization, horizontal polarization here, and a vertical polarization here. So it's two beams with cross polarization, which go against one another. What is the phase difference between these two beams? One is EIKZ and the other one is minus EIKZ. So the phase difference is 2KZ. So when you pop, when you go along Z, the phase difference between one linear polarization and the other is 2KZ. Now, what happens when 2KZ is equal to pi over two? This means that you have a cosine oscillation here and a sine oscillation here. And the combination of a cosine and a sine is a circular polarization. So you see that these two beams interfere to give you circular polarization in one way, which are the red polarization I showed here, and in between circular polarization in, in the other direction. So you have an alternance of sigma minus and sigma plus polarization with a periodicity lambda over two. So this is just classical optics. If you, if you superpose two linearly polarized lasers, you have a constant intensity because you cannot have an interference between uh, light which are polarized in different directions. So the intensity remains constant, but the polarization switches from sigma plus to sigma minus to sigma plus and so on. And you have a periodic variation of the circular polarization. And this is very interesting uh, for optical pumping effects. And so I try to explain what happens starting from there. What you see is that when you have a sigma plus polarization, the red one, the light, and you take an atom which has three sublevels, like the rubidium 87 is like that. You have F equal one here and F equal two in the excited state. So you have a structure like this one. And you see that if you excite with sigma plus light, you will mainly shift down the energy of this state, much less this one and almost not this one because this matrix element is much bigger than this one and that one. So you see that in sigma plus polarization, the light shift go like this. And you see also that the optical pumping forces the atom to go in this level. So you have the optical pumping which pushes the atom here and the energy shift which brings this state down. Now, if on the other hand, you look at what happens when you are in the sigma minus polarization zone, it's the opposite. This is this level which is shifted down and the optical pumping is bringing the atom in this state. So you see that you have two effects which are correlated. As the atom moves, he sees a periodic variation of the light shifts and a periodic variation of the direction of the optical pumping. And so we will see what happens on the next slide. You see, if you are now, if you, the atom arrives in this sigma plus zone here, what happens in the sigma plus zone is that the blue level has the highest energy. And of course, the red level has the lowest energy. So you are in a region here where if the atom is in the blue level, he will have the highest light shift energy. And this is a point at which it, it will be pumped in the strongest way towards the other state. So what happens is that when the atom reaches this point, he is pumped efficiently to get in the other state. So he goes from the high energy down to a low energy. And then he will continue going on. So he will climb this potential hill. And when it arrives, so he's, after that he's climbing this hill. And when it arrives at the summit of this red potential here, the opposite process will occur. It will be pumped like this in the other direction and he will fall 
in this level, which is the one which is now the deepest one. And so you see that what happens when as the atom moves is that he, each time he reaches the summit of a, of a potential well, he is brought back by optical pumping at the bottom of the valley. And so he keeps climbing mountains and falling down, climbing mountains and falling down. And as he climbs mountains, of course, it loses kinetic energy. So it keeps exhausting its kinetic energy as it moves in this corrugated potential. And so you see that there is a combination of optical pumping and light shifts, which are combined in such a way that the atom will lose energy very efficiently. And this is called, for this reason, it was called uh, a kind of a Sisyphus effect, because in, in remembrance of this uh, uh, character of the antiquity with Sisyphus, who was doomed to uh, carry a rock, and each time he was reaching the summit of a mountain, the rock was falling down and he had to, to carry it again up. And this is what happens with the atoms. The atoms are like Sisyphus, and they lose, they keep losing kinetic energy by a combination of dissipative and reactive effects. And so what is the limit? The limit of subdoppler cooling is, of course, when the kinetic energy will be so small that the atom will not be able to climb the next hill. And so the limiting temperature is just such that Kb T is equal to the depth of the well, which is omega square over four delta. And when you put orders of magnitude, you find that the ratio of the Sisyphus to the Doppler temperature can be as small as one over 100. So you understand that this process is very efficient and cools down atoms much more than just Doppler cooling. So at this point, you might think naively that you just have to bring omega to zero. If you bring omega to zero, T Sisyphus will go to zero. So is zero degree the limit? And of course, for deep physical reasons, you can never reach omega equals zero. What will be the limit here? The limit will be the recoil of the last photon. In fact, when the at, at some point, the atom will not be able to reach the next summit. So the interaction with light will stop, but the last photon that the atom will scatter will bring an energy of the order of h bar k square over 2m. And so the recoil temp the, temp the limit of temperature is recoil, T recoil, which is about, for rubidium, about one micro Kelvin. So you find that this combination of dissipation and reactive forces can you bring down to about one micro Kelvin. Now, I will talk about traps. In fact, an optical molasses is not a trap. The atoms are, are very slow, but nothing forbids them to fall. And in the gravitational field of the Earth, if you just make a moat, the atoms will escape from the moat finally and fall. So you need to add another force, which depends on position. A trapping force, is, it does not have to depend on velocity, it has to depend on position, which will forbid the atoms to, to escape from a, a small region of space. And the first trap, which was light trap, which was invented, was called a MOT trap, a magneto-optical trap. And it combines magnetic forces with optical forces. In fact, it's a MOT, and you surround the MOT with coils in which you apply currents in opposite direction. So instead of having the current going in the same direction in the two coils, you have coils in which the current goes like that. And it means that at the center of the coil, the magnetic field is zero and the magnetic field increases in all directions from the center. And so you have a minimum of the magnetic field. And because the, these atoms carry magnetic moments, you have a magnetic force which adds uh, to, to the dissipative and reactive forces of the mode. So I don't, don't want to enter into too many details, but you see what you do is that you apply the counter probating lasers, Apollo has sigma plus in one sense, sigma minus in the other. And the magnetic field is such that the Zeeman effect, the variation of the energy levels is linear and crosses at the center of the trap structure. And what happens is that when the atom 
if an atom is going from left to right and reach this point, the Zeeman effect is compensates the, the shift, the fact that these lasers are below resonance. And at this point, you get a strong force pulling back the atoms from right to left. And the opposite happens at this point, Z1. This is now this laser, which gets in resonance with the Zeeman uh, slope here. And the atoms are rejected from Z1 back inside. And so the atoms stay between Z1 and Z2. And this is true in the, all three directions. So this combination of magnetic fields with uh, the, the forces of the molasses makes a very efficient trap, which is called the magneto-optical trap. And you see here a very uh, bright spot. This is the fluorescence of calcium atoms, which are trapped in a mode. And you have here about hundreds of millions or one, one billion atoms, which are trapped at the intersection of the laser beams. So I think we will stop at this point, And I will, in the second part of the talk, I will describe the kind of experiment you can do when you have these ingredients, this possibility to cool atoms or to trap them what kind of interesting experiment have been done. So we'll stop and we'll resume in 10 minutes from now. <laughs>